All right. So we are in module number four, and we stand uh, one fourth of the way through the entire semester. So far, so good. Uh, this module is supposed to cover three chapters, but tech being tech, uh, one of the three chapters that we're going to cover has become obsolete. So in its place, I have two links to show you. So this first recording will capture chapters 10 and 11, and then we'll do chapter 12 next. So chapter 10, performance tuning and system recovery. Um, performance tuning establishes important things. Uh, that's uh, key number one is establishing a baseline. Key number two is recognizing any bottlenecks and from those two tuning the performance to ensure that Windows runs as smooth as it should or as smooth as it can. Uh, a baseline is important no matter what you do, whether that is installing an OS that you're going to deploy out to multiple systems, uh, whether that's configuring a server, uh, you need to have a baseline. You need to know what the machine is supposed to do, the load it's supposed to be carrying, the amount of data coming in and out. You really need to understand what is happening on the system and what should be happening on the system. This will help you immensely when you have to troubleshoot. If you have to guess what is an anomaly, that's just gonna to take too much time. But if you create a baseline when the system is at an acceptable place, it will make your life so much easier when you have to deal with problems. When you have that baseline and you're able to identify what is normal, you are then able to figure out anomalies like bottlenecks. For example, a disk bottleneck. If you realize that uh, a disk is running slower than it should, uh, well, the only way to know that it's running slower than it should is if you have a baseline of its performance, then you're able to quickly distinguish this specific drive is running slower. So we can either switch the disk or upgrade or whatever needs to happen but that is only possible if we know how the system is supposed to function. Same with bottle, with uh, memory. Just because those are chips doesn't mean they won't fail. If a program suddenly is requiring more memory than usual, we can begin investigating that because we know what the normal is for those applications. A virtual memory used to be an important thing when we had uh, spinning hard drives. Now with SSDs, uh, phys uh, the virtual memory is pretty much a, a moot point just because it runs as fast uh, as the regular memory. So uh, loading, loading information in and out of virtual memory is pretty easy. And if you're not familiar with virtual memory, it's basically a page file that is saved on your hard drive. Any program that's up and running but isn't requiring RAM gets sent to the virtual memory to, to hang there until it's needed. So if you're running on a slow spinning disk, it's going to take a while for that, that data to get back up to memory to be used. But now with SSDs, it's not a problem. Again, having a bottle, a, uh, a baseline will help you realize when uh, there is a processor bottleneck when there's too many processes running because what define too many? Well, that depends on the baseline of the system. Then from there, you can see what you can do, like upgrading the processor itself or adding additional if, if the motherboard can handle two or more uh, or using multi-cores. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember if virtual memory is used for S3 sleep, but if as long as the system is, uh, as long as the system is utilizing memory, you can, you can have uh, data fly over to virtual. I know if uh, like hibernation, it will take all of memory and put it into the virtual disk or the virtual 
uh, memory to hold there until the system is turned on again. Just like the other points, you also have networking. If the computer is making too many connections at once, if it is uh, trying to DOS the system, if it is trying to send odd communications, the only way to know this and identify this is if you have a baseline. So once you have that baseline and you know what normal is, then it again, it's very easy to find those variations. And when you find those variations from the baseline, it's easy now to take the appropriate steps to fix uh, that problem. As always, you should document any changes you make. Windows comes with native tools to monitor the performance, uh, normally called Perfmon. It's an MMC snap-in that has uh, some important areas for you to use. You don't have to install other tools. You can use these native tools. So here's an example of the overview of the performance monitor telling you the, the idle time of the disk, telling you uh, CPU information. You can dig deeper into the performance monitor and get, whoops, and get more information. For example, uh, the real-time monitoring of resources. You can look at the CPU and look by the process, processor IDs to see which process is running. Uh, you can control any process that might be going a little out of control. Here's what it looks like for a CPU. In this case, we have two, uh, two programs that are currently suspended. They're not running in the CPU. They're just hanging for, uh, for now. Those are the two in blue. The others are actually running. You see their processor or the process ID. You see the overall usage of the CPU, um, and we did. And you also see on the chart that uh, not too long ago, within the minute, we've used 100% of the CPU. Disk will tell you the disk performance. Again, it shows you the snippet of the last minute. Same with networking, tells you any uh, TCP connection details since UDP is connectionless. Also tells you how memory is doing and how much memory is being used. Uh, the performance monitor it has your, your visual displays that you can use. You can uh, sort things in, in different ways. There's the counters uh, that you can divide out to see processor, memory, physical disk, so on and so forth. It's handy because it does come with charts that you can create along with a report. So if you need to add it into a ticket, if you need to visually show uh, the difference between normal and abnormal, it's great. When Creating the baseline, you can use the data collector sets when something weird is happening. It's an anomaly that we need to dig into. That's where the data collector set can also kick in. And it'll log all its information to disk. This is not always running and that's actually ideal because if you don't need to record everything that's happening, then that's okay. Uh, so great for baselining and great when a problem is brought up and we need to investigate. You can configure alerts, which is great. That way you're not looking at these logs all the time. Uh, so it can either do things like log in an entry in the application event log or start a collector set and run a scheduled task. Your data manager will be in charge of controlling the specific log files that were generated by this set. And you can specify any policies needed, like how much free, free disk space are we gonna uh, dedicate to this specific thing? 
the maximum number of folders we can create, any report generation, and what are we going to do when we have when we run out of this dedicated space? Do we can we get rid of the old stuff to make room for the new? Your reports are processed uh, log files. You can specify specifically what you want to see. Uh, normally, you don't need to do that, but just if your report is unique and it needs specific information, you can edit the report uh, for your needs. Uh, the task manager, we should all be familiar with it, how it looks, what to do with it. So I don't spend too much time, but this is a tool that you can use. And to get to it, you could either right click on the, the Windows bar and select Task Manager or do Control Shift Escape uh, to pull it out. Uh, so again, this is just a quick run through of the Task Manager. Uh, things that we have seen since what, like Windows 95. You see the processes and the information to, uh, for each process that's running. Uh, you can set an affinity if you so want. You do have the services tab, which didn't exist in the task manager for the longest time, but now you can see the running processes and uh, their status. There is the performance, which again has been around for a while. The new thing about it is it does link to the resource monitor. So if you wanted to dig further, you can. As you can see, here's the usual thing that we see. And then open resource monitor down at the bottom. Uh, in task manager, you can also see any app history of the users. If we need to log somebody out because they're, they've been disconnected for a while, you can do that from, from the task manager along with uh, what applications start up as soon as a user logs in. Your performance options has things like the visual effects, the processing schedule, and virtual memory. It's sitting kind of buried because you got to go into system and to the advanced tab and then the performance section. Um, in the tabs, you have like the visual effects. If you want to turn off uh, like Windows Arrow in order to not get uh, all the cool graphics because you need to run in a, a less graphics mode, you can do that from there. Uh, you have your advanced tab that says what programs, uh, if a program that runs in the background, what kind of priority does it get versus the programs that you are running uh, yourself like Word or Firefox or Brave or Zoom. Uh, within the advanced tab, you see what you can define for the virtual memory. And normally, Windows can handle it. If you want to specifically say, a, uh, instead of using the C drive, use the D drive, you, you specify that here. Or specify not to use a page file at all. Uh, the DEP, the Data Execution Prevention, is here. This basically ensures that any uh, program does not go to unauthorized memory space. For example, where Windows itself lives. The kernel is sitting outside of user space in memory so that no program, no malicious program can get access to it and take full control of the system. Uh, this thing is only looking at the Windows specific programs that make the operating system run. And it does come into play if a piece of malware uh, tries to get into that space to make the, uh, the kernel do things it shouldn't. Um, if you've ever worked with Windows, you know that errors suck because they tend to not be detailed. They tend to be really vague and we have, we have to go on a long goose chase to find the event ID and find others with the same issue. Uh, they have been getting better, but I wouldn't say it's the best thing ever. There is this little item, the steps recorder. If uh, you can't get to a system, but 
users complaining of a problem, you can use this to capture a screenshot every time a user clicks on an item. And it's saved uh, in a format that you that they can email and, and read letter. It's not a keylogger. So a user would have to add some comments for later review, but it does at least take screenshots as, as a person is clicking through something to show a problem. Anything that shows system stability that we can graph goes under the uh, reliability monitor. So we have things like when the, a so piece of software installs or uninstalls, any application failures, any Windows failures are miscellaneous. Uh, the event viewer. I tend to avoid the event viewer. I'd rather use something like Splunk to read data. But if you don't have Splunk around and you need to look at what's happening on the system, the event viewer is your next best choice. It, you can pull it itself as an MMC or open up computer management and get to it. You'll see all the logs that are happening everywhere along with what you can do to troubleshoot. Here's what event viewer looks like. You have places to filter. Uh, some, it used to be that you couldn't find more information, had to Google it yourself. Now you can click on the online help and it'll take you uh, to the event ID and hopefully will provide you with information to dig further. So not only do you have application install uninstalls, you also have things like security log, which keeps track of who logged in when. You have the system log for any general operating system stuff. Uh, applications and services, any, anytime a program ran and created an event, that's where that gets saved. You can put a custom view to see specific things that you choose, along with any uh, a subscription to copy events from a remote computer to yours. So if you're trying to monitor a system that you can't get to physically, if you set the subscription node on ahead of time, you're able to pull those events over. You can search by event ID, you can search by source. There's a number of items you can search by to get information that you need in order to find out what happened with the program or why it closed, why it's not working, et cetera. Uh, file recovery is an important item. You should be doing backups of your uh, important data. You should not just assume that the, that the system will work always. It'll either be corrupted in memory, data can be corrupted in, on the disk, in transit, uh, a power outage or power surge. There's many things that could happen uh, to cause memory to fail. You want to have a backup of your information. Yes, Event Viewer is the Windows equivalent of Syslog. Uh, file history is one way to do a backup on the system. Uh, it's good if a user accidentally deleted or accidentally modified a file that they shouldn't. You can restore it back to a, um, a version that Windows knows. It would not be, I would not recommend file history as a form of backup because it's saving on the disk itself. And if that disk fails, then out it goes. But it is great if you're using like Windows Server and you're sharing files and somebody accidentally overwrites a file, you could use file history to quickly restore the file uh, and, and avoid, avoid total mayhem. It's just not, something that you should use as backup. See, in this case, we're backing up to a volume, to a different volume. This is better. But we're taking the, what's happening on our system and we're backing up that data to a different drive.
This is better. Some more optional settings where you can exclude a certain folder or folders. But you do ideally want to back up to a, a, a external drive or a network drive, something off of the computer that's being backed up. Uh, there's the one utility that you can use to clean up any backed up files because as you create more versions of it, that's going to take more, uh, more disk space. Uh, so you always want to be careful how, how many files you're using file history on because it has to keep track of each and every one. Uh, the backup and restore is still around. Uh, Windows 10 uses it. You can also use any plethora of tools to back up a system like a Cronus and, and whatnot to back up systems. But you do have, a, at the very least, you have a tool native to Windows. So here you can set up a backup that, that'll either create a system image, a system repair disk, and backing up where you're going to run uh, data to. The first time you set it up, of course, you have to say where the backup will go. And then from there, it'll do it uh, on a regular basis. Um, yeah, you could have a NAS system with ZFS and, and share that with others. And as long as Windows can read to it, then it could save it there. In this case, our backup is saving any files that are in the libraries and personal folder files. So it's not backing up Windows itself. It's backing up the, the user's data. In this case, if Windows dies and we don't have a system repair disk or a system image disk, we'll have to reinstall Windows, but then we'll be able to use our backup to bring back the important files that were in libraries and personal folders. So you want to you want to be clear as to what your backup is actually saving. When we need to restore, it can be through either previous versions if we have that enabled. Otherwise, we could just restore from the backup. Here's previous versions. Again, this is saved locally. You can choose which uh, to which to back up from. We could look into the history and maybe pull out uh, whole folders from the past. It is also possible uh, to back up the OneDrive uh, data if you just accidentally. Uh, delete something within OneDrive, it really just goes to the recycle bin so you can bring it back. If a Windows system doesn't boot, time to use some form of recovery. You can either do system restore, which again, this is uh, saved on the local drive. This is assuming that the local drive is still functioning well and did not get corrupted. From here, we could uh, also call a, uh, a backup from another location. Uh, we can specify what disks we're protecting. You can have more than one restore point. Uh, it is automatically triggered by things like updates or scheduled tasks or applications that can trigger system restore to function. You can also use PowerShell to do these kinds of things. And here are some commandlets that you could use. Either way, you can bring up system restore and see uh, what points you have to restore from. You can also use the Windows recovery environment to pull system restore. As long as we can read the disk, we can use that to pull out any 
restore uh, restore images to bring back. It used to be a very big problem to have the right driver installed, uh, but more and more drivers are showing up in Windows Update that actually work and have been signed and tested. So this is not necessarily a bad thing anymore, but just know that you still are able to roll back a driver just in case it doesn't work, uh, like the, due to instability or it causes Windows to crash like it used to or blue screen, you can roll back a driver. Within Device Manager, you would click on a, uh, any of the devices under Driver, you can roll back. As long as there is a driver to roll back to, you'll have that there. Uh, the recovery drive will contain the Windows system files and any recovery tools necessary. Again, this is something you wanna have on an external drive in order to have it handy just in case system goes down and we need to restore. It does require admin privileges to run. Uh, Windows RE is a great environment. If you ever worked with, um, uh, not sys internals, Windows, uh, what was it called? Oh, MS Dart. If you look up MS Dart, that is an array of tools that you can use to recover um, Windows. Uh, that comes with Windows RE. So if you ever find uh, MS Dart as an ISO, that's a, that's a great set of tools that are already built in to help restore any Windows systems. Uh, how often would you recommend backing up your computer? That depends on the work that it's doing. Uh, I've had servers where they would back up every 15 minutes, every hour, uh, every six hours, every day, and the backups would roll up throughout the day. It depends on the data that you're using, uh, the data that you're working with, and the, uh, the needs that you have for that data. It could be that backing up once a day is fine or backing up once a week is fine. It, it all depends on the sensitivity and the necessity of the data that we're talking about. Uh, Windows RE, it's possible to pull up when uh, you are on a system and you get uh, the F5, F8, you can pull this up. Uh, within it, you have the traditional things like safe mode, safe mode with networking, uh, disabling automatic restart, debugging mode, that kind of stuff. There is a possibility to reset Windows 10, getting rid of all the applications and setting everything back to default. Uh, if the computer can't boot Windows, then it's kind of hard to do this reset. At that point, you'll need something like Windows RE to boot from in order to restore. And at that point, you can define to either keep or remove all, all data. Good questions. Any others regarding this chapter? Mom, you can restore like a user account information to a fresh machine. As long as the two boxes are identical to each other, it's completely possible to restore, kind of like you would uh, taking a backup image of one system and deploying it elsewhere.
Uh, the advantage of having system reset over an install disk is it, it's happening from the disk. So uh, as long as the disk itself isn't bad, it would be faster to reset the system over installing from, from an install disk. A disadvantage would be if the physical disk is bad, that's not gonna work so well. Also, if you have a malware who is a, uh, a persistent, it's not gonna be a good thing to try to reset because it'll probably realize it and find a way to stay on the system even after the reset. Yes, it does require the system partition to be intact. Uh, if you have a custom window set up, you can save that image to, a, you should be able to save that image to a restore partition because it will be, it'll be tied to that system. You're basically creating a backup of that, that custom system in case, in case when Windows dies. Right, it's not a setting, a recovery partition isn't a setting that's already enabled. You have to turn it on. So that's probably why you don't see it uh, in many systems, but you do see it in a lot of OEM systems. And it'll restore along with all the bloatware that, that the uh, OEM had it with. I know when I used to have Windows, I would I would get rid of that recovery partition because it it came with all the bloatware, even if I tried to get it out. So I would have to uh, wipe the whole drive, and install Windows fresh, and create a restore partition that wouldn't have all the bloatware. Right, with things like that, uh, McAfee being pre-installed. Or other, other bloatware that I don't want. I see more typing. Um, uh, would I install the OEM automatic driver and firmware update program? You know, those, uh, those aren't actually, uh, bad. I would, I would go with the OEM. but there used to be a whole lot of other bloatware that was unnecessary. A quick uh, talk about chapter 11 before I stop this recording, because I said this would have uh, both chapters. Uh, chapter 11 in the book actually covers Microsoft Intune, but uh, Microsoft Intune is actually a thing of the past now. It's now Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So I'll put the link and put it in the live stream channel. If you want to uh, get a little tour of it, there's also the link. But Intune is what this has become. 
where you can handle uh, multiple devices, multiple endpoint devices in one location. So you have, there's the Intune console as it used to stand, but now it's part of this, uh, where as long as the systems are part of the domain, we can control we can control them, we can manage them, like updates, configuration changes, so on and so forth, in one, all in one, uh, one umbrella. It can handle things like uh, BOID, it handles zero trust, especially with so many uh, people working from home, you have to have something like zero trust enabled. Uh, the device doesn't have to be enrolled into our system, but we can still protect our data. Uh, we have uh, better analytics than we could with Intune. Uh, it scales because it's running on Azure and should be uh, a good return on investment because again, we're dealing with many systems that are everywhere, especially now, and how do we protect our data, which is the most important thing for us and in uh, this whole infrastructure is built around that. I suggest doing the, the tour, get yourself familiar with uh, this new infrastructure that has replaced uh, just the one. So I, I would not expect uh, in tune as a separate item anymore because it's now under one, under the endpoint manager. 